All right. So the IDS uh, is like Snort that just watches the network traffic to see if known bad things are coming in. And IPS prevents it, typically by changing a firewall rule. So you can have one of them protecting a whole network, or you can have an individual one on each host. And the one that runs on each host might have access to the log files on that host, so it might do a more thorough job like Tripwire, or it also does file integrity monitoring. So is there yeah. only Most people keep a network and a host, or is it hybrid, or no? Uh, I, from what I hear about, now people have um, these endpoint protection systems like Carbon Black, and they include file integrity monitoring, and that's, and but I'm not quite sure exactly how much it looks at network traffic. I don't know the answer at big companies. They have a lot of these commercial products. I know this space is changing a lot. I was just hearing on Pulse Security Weekly today, they were talking about how the file integrity monitoring like Tripwire seems to have been integrated into Carbon Black and such. Right, because, yeah, I've always asked this, and it, it's never <coughs> really where it really is. Well, this. it keeps changing, and the new hotness is all the enterprise class devices now claim to have artificial intelligence. So, <laughs> On top I, of it. yes. So it's not just a fixed set of rules. It's actually learning what your normal traffic is and noticing what's not normal or something like that. And I'm not quite sure how well that works. I would imagine it probably doesn't work very well yet, but it is coming. The only thing I have an issue or question that AI wanted to address. Yeah. How, who is validating whether what they're reporting is correct or not? Well, I know. And that's why what they claim is it's accurate enough to save your instant response team time by correctly finding the things you need to investigate. I, um, that's what you, the goal would be. I kind of doubt they can really be up to doing that very well yet. But I haven't played with them. They're expensive. Um, so you'd have your intrusion detection system out here. Um, this is what you do for just detection. You put in a network cap to make an extra copy of all the traffic and then send it to your niche server, which would just detect everything without blocking it. That's, um, that's the way you typically would use Splunk. You'd forward this to your SIEM system. And then the network intrusion detection system alerts would be part of the log files you're looking through. And that doesn't stop anything, but it means you can analyze what's been going on after the fact, after something alerts you to an intrusion. Here's the NIPS, where it now comes back and sends signals over to the firewall and actually blocks certain things. So, and this yeah. Must, this is uh, slower than the... Well, I don't think it's necessarily slower, but it is kind of dangerous because an attacker can figure this out and use your, uh, your NIPs against you they can send an attack that appears to come from a customer to make you block that customer. That's why this is uh, considered somewhat risky. It creates a DOS vulnerability. And so the simple kind is pattern matching. That's what Snort does. It just has rules. And if you match the rule, then it triggers an alert. Um, you can also look for protocol errors. And the more advanced thing is anomaly detection, where you somehow measure what normal traffic is and you trigger anything that deviates enough from normal. The problem is people do a lot of weird things on networks, and a lot of things happen that look really fishy that are, in fact, okay, and it's really hard for your system to... So these anomaly detection tends to have a lot of false positives and waste your time chasing down events that are not, in fact, problems. So you typically have an SIEM system somewhere <coughs> which gathers all the information from all your sensors in one place so you can search it. And uh, this is now a very good idea. Now, the original plan was continuous monitoring. That was the old system where you were for compliance monitoring. You would continuously monitor to make sure that everything was updated and the patches were on and that you people were not installing unauthorized devices and they weren't opening new ports by turning on services. That was continuous security monitoring for compliance. And people thought that was great, but they discovered that that did not actually protect your network from getting hacked very well. Um, so the modern system is expecting to have um, all the defenses and the monitoring, and then you also need an IR team because you know that some people are going to punch through all that. And even though you have all these defenses, you are still going to have intrusions on your network and you have to have a response when that happens. Data loss prevention, we talked about, that monitors your outgoing traffic to make sure that your secrets are not leaving the network. Endpoint security, like Norton antivirus and carbon black and everything, uh, try to prevent your endpoints, which are your usual entry point for attacks, 
are protected and detecting if people are downloading malware from email attachments and so on. Um, your antivirus <coughs> typically works by blacklisting, trying to list all the bad things. One technique that sounds really great is application whitelisting. This is what F-Secure does by default. Um, and it sounds wonderful to me. It's so much more logical to enumerate all the good processes and only let known good things run. What everyone in the business I've asked about this has told me is the reason this is not done much is because managing it turns out to be a nightmare. People keep having updates and patches and new applications, and it, it is really a drag to maintain the whitelist. Um, and of course, if you do this, then they have to keep going back to some kind of administrator for permission to run every new thing. So this is the way Apple protects the iPhone. You can't put anything on it except it comes from the official store and everything there is whitelisted. And that works fine if you're willing to accept the limitation of only using apps on the approved list. But it does mean whoever's running the approved list has to provide you with everything you need. And that turns out to be very burdensome. So you can have removal media controls. Of course, ever since Windows XP Service Pack 1, auto run has been disabled. So you don't just automatically run software when you plug in a USB. Uh, disk encryption is, of course, common, increasingly common. Um, and honeypots are when you add systems just to attract attackers. Um, some people love these things. Other people think they're a waste of time. It's currently a bone of contention in the industry. Um, the only people that are sure you do this are people like antivirus companies that want malware samples. Um, but one simple thing to do is you have an address space and you're not using it all. So rather than throwing away all the traffic that goes to invalid addresses, you could just log the traffic that goes to the unused addresses because that's attacker traffic. Nobody would be going there unless they're scanning your network hunting for things. <coughs> that's a very easy way to discover who's attacking your network. People scanning the unused address ranges are obviously up to no good and you should just block them. Anyway, then asset management. You have to have configurations on your devices, your firewalls, your switches, your servers, your laptops, they all have configurations. So you should have some official standard hardened um, configuration where you've removed the apps you're not using and block the ports you're not using and remove the extra things like the, the horrible garbage that HP puts on every laptop, their stupid backup thing and photo thing. Have your baseline that removes the obvious junk and that should be where everything starts. And you should have a record of that in some way of enforcing it. And then, of course, patch management. You have to have a system of testing patches because Microsoft patches, ooh, the last two years, they've been horrible. And at the same time, they try to force us to take automatic updates. At the same time, the patches break everything right and left, which is a really bad two things to put together. Um, so you, you have to test the patch to make sure it isn't one of the bad ones. And then you have to push it out to make sure everybody gets it. And that is actually a really painful, difficult job because Microsoft quality control is so terrible. Anyway, um, uh, vulnerability management is where you run a vulnerability scanner like Nessus or something, and you try to find the vulnerabilities. There are, of course, vulnerabilities that your scanner does not know about. There are the zero days, and the nation states have them, and the advanced hackers have them, and you really can't do much about it. That's why you have to get over the belief that your barrier defenses are preventing all the attacks, and accept that after you do the best you can, some people are still going to get through, and you have to have somebody detecting and responding when that happens. A Nessus is the most com most popular one, and it's got a free version. Uh, then there's a ton of others. Eh, um, but Nessus is the, it's really easy to use too now. It used to be pretty hard. They've, they've made it a lot easier. It's really fast too. You can scan a Windows system in like five minutes or something. It used to take a lot longer. Nessus is much better than it's ever been. So um, change management is where if you want to change something like add another subnet, update an operating system on a server or anything like that, you have to go through a process of submitting it to a board who considers the change and then approves it because changing something is not a matter of just logging in and typing code on the server. You have to make sure that everybody that's using that server knows about the change or help desk knows. They have considered whether it's going to break something else. You know, that's like we're saying, this guy that didn't go through the proper code uh, staging process is a real cowboy at a company. You don't, there's a loose cannon. He's damaging things and you don't even know what's happening. That's why you have this irritating process where you have to ask for permission to change things before you do it and then record it properly and then notify people properly about the change. So here's all the step, you know, you identify something you want, you propose a change, then you assess what the consequences of the change are going to be. Then you test it to see what harm it does 
then you get approval and schedule it and then notify everybody, you know, this is what you really have to do. If you're grown up and you seriously want to not disrupt the company with your ill-considered changes. All right. So we got B here, which should be at the bottom and it is all right. One of my students did HIPAA compliance or PCI compliance at a company. And one of the first things he found is everybody was just logging into the server as root all the time. And you, and so that's one of the things you have to do is if you cannot do that, everybody has to have their own account. So we have a log of what everybody did. So when a bad thing happens, we know that's one of the many things. Another step of maturity, you know, you can't be doing that. And you can't have people just going up and executing commands on the server and breaking things without having some kind of record of what's going on. It's, these are all the stages of maturity. And I know as a tech, technical geek, I find this all oh, management's always just irritating with their stupid rules and procedures, but you know, there's a reason for rules and procedures sometimes. Not at my college, but some management systems actually do accomplish something valuable. <coughs> now it looks like we can go. I think five is the number of cahoots. <coughs> All right, so which defense presents PII from leaving the network? Personally identifiable information. Okay, that is DLP, data loss prevention. Which defense correlates data from many sources? That's your SIEM, Security Information and Event Management System. That's what Splunk is. All right, which system blocks everything unrecognized? <laughs> That's whitelisting. You have a list of approved stuff and anything not on the list is blocked. That is, of course, very secure. It works on the iPhone and the iPad. It's just very cumbersome to implement, but it really is very secure. What defense compares traffic to a baseline of normal activity? <laughs> That's anomaly detection. You somehow measure what's normal, and then you detect deviation from normals. Robert, PC, and B. So it's Robert, and PC, and B. All right. So, a little more of this to do. So, continuity of operations. This is helping your business continue functioning after a bad thing has happened. So there are many aspects of this service level agreements so where you have providers that promise to achieve a certain level of, of uh, performance and have some kind of specified punishment if they don't. Um, you have fault tolerance. Uh, faults are unavoidable. Faults are when something breaks. Failures are avoidable. Failures are when the end user no longer gets service. So if you have a server cluster, one server can fail, and that's a fault, but the customers still get service because the other servers provide the service. That's what the fault tolerant system is. It can't withstand the fault without causing a failure. So to backup is one system for this. You have backups of all your stuff, uh, full backup of all the data, or you have incremental backup where you have only the data that's changed since the last backup or differential backup, various systems to try to make backups faster. You can have RAIDs, which by the way, do not replace backups. RAIDs are a high availability solution, so the data remains available even when it disk drives, but if your building burns down, a RAID is not gonna save you. The only thing that's gonna save you is a backup. I had trouble with that at first. Why do you need both backup and RAID? But they serve completely different purposes. RAID prevents a short-term outage because the drive went down, 
backup is disaster recovery. After the building burns down, what do you do? Anyway, so you have the many rates. The right set just has the data spread across several volumes just so it can read and write faster, and it is not fault tolerant. A mirrored set is where you have two copies of all the data going on two identical drives, so it doubles the price of the drive, but of course it's very tolerant. If one drive fails, you have another copy already there of everything, and the other ones like RAID 5 and so on have a pattern of many drives and extra copies dispersed among the drives so that one or two or more of the platters can fail and you can reconstruct the data from what's on the other platters. So that's mirroring is duplicating it, uh, skipping is writing across many disks, Parity is the system used to create the fault tolerant. You XOR the data on some of the drives and write the XOR to another drive, and that's the system used to create the parity bits you can use to reconstruct it. So there's many different levels of it. The, one of the popular ones is RAID 5, of course. <coughs> and you can have complicated aggregates where you have RAID 1 plus 0, where you have a striped volume and another striped volume that mirrors it. And you can have a RAID 10 where you have two RAID 5s and they're mirroring. You can have big clusters with large numbers of disks and some complicated system. And they all are just another way of somehow having extra copies of the data. Now, if you are a Microsoft person, you should know that Microsoft decided uh, about five years ago that this is all garbage. Because two problems. The first thing is, suppose you have a terabyte drive. You have like five platters, each one terabyte. You have one block goes bad, you throw away the whole drive. Then you have to regenerate a whole terabyte of data. This is an incredible waste of money. And what they do instead is they now have um, their new file system, the refiles, resilient file system, where it puts blocks on the drive and it, it makes extra copies of blocks in a pattern. And if one block fails, it marks it bad and uses the rest of the disk. So it uses the one platter in a fault tolerant way. And they say that is faster and cheaper and better than this RAID stuff and they've switched to it. But anyway, a lot of us are still using RAID. So in general, you have system redundancy beyond the hard drives. You have to have extra power supplies, extra network connections, extra firewalls. You know, you should just have no single anything. Everything should have an alternative system, and that's how you make a high availability cluster. So then you've got uh, business continuity planning. will ensure that your business will continue during and after a disaster. So you have a strategic long-term plan of some way to move to another location or outsource or move some of your functions to a business partner or otherwise survive a disaster. The disaster recovery plan is one part of the business continuity plan. <coughs> and this is how you deal with a specific disaster like an earthquake or a fire or something that causes one area to be destroyed. And so you've got a bunch of related plans. Your business continuity plan is a whole big thing how you're going to handle all these problems. The continuity operation plans focuses on how your IT will survive an IT disaster like a virus outbreak. You have your incident response plan for hack attacks. You have your disaster recovery plan here for things like earthquakes and fires. You've got business resumption plan. You've got crisis communication plans. So you're telling everybody what they need to know, like you tell your employees what they need to know about should you not go to this building, but go to another building. And Emergency plan for the occupants, what you do if the building is collapsing and the people are in there, you should have some place to take them and some way to count them and make sure they all got out and all that jazz. You know, all these are part of the business continuity plan. So as part of this planning, you have to determine the maximum tolerable downtime. How long can you do without certain parts of your business? So you can just leave them alone to take some time to recover them because it could be really expensive to recover them quickly. You'd have to have something like a duplicate system in another location and network traffic constantly updating it. So you only want to do that for the things that you really need to recover very quickly. And the things where you can afford to wait a few days can wait until you dig up your backup tapes and play them and stuff. So you have natural causes like earthquakes and then you have humans like terrorism and bombs and insider threats and disgruntled administrators that wipe out the drives and all that jazz and then power blackouts and so on. All these things, you should have a plan to handle all these things. So errors and omissions is the most common mistake. <coughs> most of the time, 
big companies go down, like Amazon went down for four days about five years ago, and everyone said they got hacked, and Amazon said, no, we were trying to improve our fault tolerance. We had a load balancing system, and we switched to a new, better load balancing system, and we got it backwards. So instead of moving the traffic away from the busy server, it moved all the traffic to the most busy server and brought us down. And it took us four days to back it out and go back to the old one, and that's what usually happens. Usually things go down because your own staff does something wrong. <laughs> so anyway, that's the most common reason. Anyway. Of course, temperature and humidity will cause your stuff to crash and fail, and you have to have uh, the defenses against that. And there's all these other things, uh, warfare and terrorism and such. People don't worry about it much in America. In Europe, they worry about it a lot more. And there are data centers under the sea, in undersea domes, and there are data centers in old government uh, nuclear bomb shelters and behind in buildings behind fences they've got things that promise they could survive a nuclear war and your data center would stay up um i don't think people in america worry about that so much but certainly lots of, we have a lot of hurricanes and floods and stuff and so a whole region might go out in one of these classes i taught i taught i the second cicb class i ever taught was in texas and one of my students there were talking about five nines and it had just been an outage at the five nine center in san francisco 365 main that was down for like two days and five nines means you can only go down for five minutes a year so going down for two days is a serious breach of your promise there and they said did everyone leave and they asked no they didn't leave because the fact is you can't get any better everyone promises five nines nobody delivers it so they all just waited in line and brought their stuff up and they didn't go somewhere else because there's nowhere better to go. And this guy said, I achieved it. He said, we worked at Hartford Insurance. And he said, it's Hartford Insurance is the only company he knows that actually achieved five nines. And the CEO is determined to do it. And he said, you have to overbuild by a factor of 10. So he said, they overbuilt the cooling. They had five data centers. They put them hundreds of miles apart. They said, we need like so many million gallons of water to cool everything. And the guy said, how much is a million gallons of water? He said, oh, how many swimming pools is that? Well, that's about a two swimming pools so they made a swimming pool and people could swim in it but then they had to leave when they needed the water and he built four or five data centers and he said it was so good that when they had a hurricane that wiped out two whole towns they had a third data center outside the hurricane zone that stayed up so you know for enough money you can't achieve it but it's out of reach for almost anybody you get five nines and now there's some clowns promising six nines i don't know how dumb they think we are five nines mean 99.999 percent up which means five minutes of downtime per year, which is I don't know if anybody's ever got down to that level because nobody as far as I know has ever got within a factor of 10 of compliance. So the details have never mattered. <laughs> My college, we get about two nines. Yeah. You know, two nines would mean you're down three days in a year. That's probably enough for most people. But if you're really Google or something, you'd probably like to get more. Well, I guess you could. Yeah, it reminds me of, of like the, the Simpsons where they have this, how many days since an accident counter. And yeah. like they've been doing this for political campaigns, like how many days since Elizabeth Warren said something stupid or Trump fired his cabinet members or something. Yes, like, that's one simple measure of quality. Would that number ever reach 100? 100 days since you did something awful. Anyway, then of course you got communications failures. You have the line breaks, hurricanes, failures of the internet, failures of your phone network. So you got a plan. You respond, you activate the team, you have to somehow communicate with your disaster recovery team members so they can come in. Then um, you assess the problem and reconstruct it. So you have to determine uh, how bad the damage is, decide whether the buildings are still safe to use or you have to evacuate the buildings. Then you have to communicate with your team, which may be difficult during a disaster, and they may have difficulty reaching your location during a disaster, so you have to have plans for that. And uh, then you assess um, the extent of the damage and determine um, what part of it needs to be fixed and on what schedule the broken things need to be fixed. And then you start recovering your processes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Call tree is where you, I call you, and you're going to call those three people, and they're going to call those ten okay. people. That's one possible way to do it. Yeah. Good. All right. And uh, then you have a salvage team trying to 
recover the damaged stuff and save what's good from it. And uh, so that's your plan. And you know, one thing I went and toured the AT and T. AT and T had a tour of their disaster recovery center. It was very impressive. They had a bunch of trucks, and in the trucks were full of fiber optics and Cisco routers and power supplies. And another one was full of like sleeping quarters, and another one was full of like food and water. And they had about ten of these trucks, and they had an armed guard truck in front, an armed guard truck behind, because that was like ten million dollars worth of Cisco routers in there. And they would drive this fleet of trucks and they could drive into the middle of something like Katrina into an empty lot. And in like two hours, they connect these things. One of them was a generator and they would have a working cell phone tower in the middle of a disaster. And that's what they have to do, right? Cause everything is broken and you got nothing. So you got to get the cell phone network back up. So that's how AT&T does it anyway. All right. So we got uh, HC. So what kind of array does not have fault tolerance? <laughs> okay, RAID 0 has no tolerance. All right. What kind of backup requires more than two tapes to recover? That's a sort of subtlety. This from my old. Uh, this was on my Net Plus and my A Plus and Microsoft exams. I'm not sure I saw it on a CSSB exam, but that's the thing. The difference between differential and incremental. Differential is where you make a full backup, and every other backup is how much has changed since that one. But incremental is where you have a full backup, and on Friday and then on Monday you make the difference from that, and on Tuesday you make the difference from Monday, and Wednesday you make the difference from Thursday. So if you try to reconstruct the way it was on Wednesday, you have to play four tapes. So if any of your tapes are lost or corrupted, you lose the ability to recover certain days. But it has the minimum amount of tape. And this is for people who have a lot of data and not the ability to make fast backups. I don't know if people really do this anymore because there are new modern options like continuous backup over the internet and, and mirroring and stuff. These are the old rules from the old uh, Microsoft rules of options for backing up to tapes. I, I suppose some people still do it, but anyway. Um, no, Time Machine, I think, is continuous backup uh, on OneDrive. You, you, everything you do is supposedly copy right there. It's just not far away. Therefore, that's not off-site backup, and that's a problem because whatever happens to your laptop will probably happen to your Time Machine drive, too. Like, the most likely thing I would think is someone will steal your backpack. And then what good would Time Machine do you? I think the only real value of Time Machine is to prevent user error. If you actually delete something, there'll be a backup there. All right, so what kind of server cluster uses all the servers all the time? <coughs> I think I skipped past this. That's load balancing. Active passive is the kind where one system is just waiting to wake up when needed, and load balancing is where they're all working all the time, so you have higher performance when they're all working. So anyway, all right. And which plan deals with a specific disruption like a fire? That's the disaster recovery plan. Disaster rec have a disaster recovery plan for fire and one for an earthquake and so on. It's the little tactical plan to deal with one problem. So B, P, C, and Robert. PC and Robert. Okay. 
So, we got time to carry on, we shall do so. All right, so to develop these glorious plans, the business continuity plan and the disaster recovery plan, you have to decide you're gonna do it, then you have to determine your scope, which can be quite difficult. There's a common issue of scope creep, also in web design, where you start a plan and then partway through they decide, oh, you should add this and add this and add this, and that's of course a problem. Then you have to do a business impact analysis where you determine how important all the parts of your business are. And then you identify controls, make a strategy, make a plan, and then you have to implement and test your plan. And then you have to have maintenance of your plan because your plan will go out of date as things change. So if you don't keep constantly checking to see what changes are needed in the plan, it will turn out not to really reflect the reality when your disaster hits. So your initiation, you gotta have a policy, the business impact analysis determines how critical all your systems are, and then you're gonna go through these same steps here. So here's a diagram of it all. Um, you've got the C-level managers that determine your policy. Our company will survive any disaster or something. Then you have the stakeholders have to go to a meeting, all the HR and the lawyers and the technical people and everybody have to get together and make sure that all their concerns have been addressed. Then you get preventive controls, things that are going to hopefully prevent us from having disaster like the antivirus to hopefully limit things. And then you have recovery plans here, and those guys have to be managers that are capable of allocating resources and spending money because it's going to cost money to implement these plans. And so then you've got, uh, that's what they're doing here. And they're going to specify the plans for how you're going to do it. As you'll see this over and over again, and you're going to hear it again at lunch, you always need top-level management buy-in for your security policy. If you don't have it, just you're wasting your time. Implementing security policies and takes money, and you have to have top-level buy-in that supports you and is willing to allocate resources to what you're doing, or you are just wasting your time. You cannot create security from bottom up. Um, uh, CEO, CIO, that the name starts with C. Yeah. <coughs> Good. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't mean they got a C in class, although the two frequently go together. <laughs> when I, I, the, the old British system, you were supposed to get a gentleman C. It was considered a failure to get a high grade in class because it meant you were spending too much time in the books and not enough time going to parties and meetings and making connections, which are what would really matter as you moved ahead. And that is probably still true. This is the thing where the nerds are not really the people you trust much because they just care about this detailed, complicated stuff. They don't socialize more, which is what really matters up at this level. Anyway. So you're planning, uh, by the way, as always, uh, your planning may not be wasted. Even if you don't have a disaster, all the organization that you put in the planning will help mature your organization. You, that's uh, probably true. That's the thing people usually don't like to hear, like all the work you have to put in an audit, like a PCI audit, seems like a waste of time, but it's not because it catches all these stupid things you were doing that were in fact costing you money like not bothering to document your changes and everybody logging in as root, that was probably hurting you even before somebody made you quit doing it. <clears throat> um, so you got a manager, somebody has to make sure that the plan is all completed and is tested, and this person, their main skill is not necessarily technical, their main skill here is negotiation and having good contacts and relations with other managers to make sure you can get the resources you need. Um, so you make a team. You have a project team with stakeholders from all these people like the line managers, IT, public relations, everybody needs to know and everybody will have concerns. If some department like IT just decides they know everything, they're gonna forget about the law and about the consequences for public relations and stuff. Um, so that's why you need somebody with resources to make sure that somebody really goes to this boring meeting and they're there to participate in the process. <coughs> so then you decide what the scope is, um, what you're gonna protect, what emergency events you're gonna consider. Um, this is where uh, one of the classic cartoons you'll see in like Dilbert is the boss sees something in a newspaper and then decides we have to implement it. And then they get scared of something. Oh, hackers might be coming in from Russia hacking us, we have to stop that. This is why you don't respond to threats, you respond to risks. A threat is a scary thing that might happen, but not all the threats are of significant risk. You have to do risk analysis and decide how much will that threat really hurt us? How likely is it to happen? How difficult would it be to prevent? You only deal with it if it passes that test. So then you list all your assets and determine what they're for and how long you could live without them and do a business impact analysis, determining uh, how 
how long you can tolerate a downtime in each business process. And then you'll have a risk assessment. So you have different risks, like the server room might be open, the software might be out of date, there might be no firewall. So that causes, there's a vulnerability. And so there's a business impact analysis of how much that would hurt you. And then there are possible mitigations to lower those risks. And now you can compare the cost of those mitigations to the cost of not mitigating it and decide which of these are worth doing. So anyway, that's the usual stuff. So you have a recovery point objective, which is how much data you're going to recover. That's why somebody asked me how often should you back up? If you only back up every day, then you might lose a whole day worth of work and have to do it over. That's your recovery point objective. If that is acceptable, that's your recovery point. So our goal is to get everything up to 24 hours ago. Recovery time objective is how long it takes to recover, which is of course quite different. And uh, there's other numbers here, but those are the main ones. Maximum tolerable downtime is recovery time objective plus the work recovery time, the time required to reconfigure the system. Mean time between failures, you often get this from hard drives and stuff. This is somebody's estimate of how long you can expect this thing to work before it fails. So it gives you some idea how frequently you're going to have to repair or replace it. It tends to be notoriously bad because people typically don't really run it that long. What they do is like increase the temperature and then try to mathematically calculate it. So I've heard many spectacular stories about how hard drives fail like long before they should and so on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've seen them quoted for hard drives, but I, one thing I've seen is Google has done a lot of real work on this. Google has done real research and published the results. And that's how they determined that it was okay to let their dinner centers be at like 90 degrees. They, there were a lot of sort of myths about this. And Google did real research and published it showing how long different brands of devices last. That I think is the best thing. Somebody that really does it. And anybody with a big data center could do it. They really have a thousand of these things. They can run it for like a year and see how many fail. And then you actually know what you need to know. Other than that, they just try and calculate it from like what the component materials are or something. And that could be wildly off. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Another thing I've... Another thing I heard at Drive Savers is that disk arrays are in fact hardly worth a damn because they say in practice, very the idea of a disk array is if I have like 10 disks, they're each going to randomly break. So the chance of one breaking is small. The chance of two breaking is really small. The chance of three breaking is equally small. And they say that is manifestly not true. Very often when one breaks, a bunch more break right at once, which would mean they're not independent which means probably breaking is caused not by just random wear, but by like power supply fluctuations that affect them all. That's the problem. And, you know, if, uh, if they're not independent, then the whole logic of RAID arrays is gone. And the, um, I thought it was funny. I went to disk drive savers for tour and I told them, well, I back up my stuff to the cloud. And they say, yeah, uh, I'm not allowed to mention the brand names, but all those cloud providers are coming to us because all their arrays are failing and we're recovering this energy. You think you're backing up your stuff to the cloud. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> that's not what you think it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you know, I went to one guy wanted me to bring my students to Turi's data center because I was teaching that plus I'm running a business to the my data center. I went to his data center. It was one windows NT 3.51 box this big under a sink with one wire going to the internet with no antivirus. And he said he was hosting websites and email and everything on that. And he said, it's fine. They're just lying about backups and stuff. You don't need any of that. I've been servicing customers for 10 years. Everybody's happy. And I'm like, if you go online and you find like the cheapest web hosting, like host, one of my students used a place called hostfor2bucks.com. And now I have a pretty good idea what you're getting if you do that. <laughs> yeah. But you know, he said, it's working fine. This is great. They're all lying. You don't need all that crap. And you don't need it until you need it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there is a period of time when you're in a fool's paradise because nothing is broken yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, all right. Um, so you got supply chain management, which is a huge issue, right? You, may, you need to buy new stuff. The stuff might not be available and you need an alternative. How long will it take to bring it in? So some vendors will actually promise to have spares or 
technicians flying like Cisco. This was the big thing about Cisco. Their stuff is expensive, but it all comes at gold level support. They totally promise that within 24 hours, they will fly in another unit and a technician to set it up for you. And, and that's why our college went with HP and everything broke, but they were trying to save money. <laughs> Milwaukee actually does yeah. pop. Yeah. We had Milwaukee. <coughs> well, there's Cisco now. The next day. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're Meraki beta testers. So they give us a lot of stuff for free and it's yeah. very nice. Yeah. And that's part of Cisco. So, I mean, that's, and also IBM, that was their big thing. IBM would really take care of you. Their stuff was always kind of out of date and kind of slow and kind of expensive, but they would really take care of you. So they said, nobody gets fired for buying IBM. And that's a good selling point. <laughs> then you got your telecommunications. You might have T1s or wireless. Your normal telephone lines might go down. Uh, you got to consider all the utilities you need, water and cooling and heating and everything. All that stuff might be gone and you need to have plans to cope with that. So there are different levels of recovery strategy. If you have no plan at all, that's the worst, of course, and the cheapest. Uh, if you have a cold site, that means you have an alternate location, but it's really not set up and you're going to have to be trucking in stuff and playing cables and stuff. If you have a warm site, then it's all ready to go. All you have to do is like play a backup tape to get it going. A hot site means everything is all ready and all you have to do is uh, turn it on and add some data. And a redundant site means it's constantly updated over the internet like a Google cluster where you could have a nuclear bomb in San Jose and Google would still work because all the data is simultaneously going all over the place and there's a backup everywhere. And unless you destroy the whole world, you're not going to stop Google. And that's, of course, the most expensive and the most wonderful situation, most fault tolerant. So that's the game here. The hot site has the equipment ready, but it might take time to load data. And the warm site has the older version equipment before you updated, so it's not quite the same. And the cold site has, at least you have the location and the power, but you don't have anything ready to go, so it's going to take weeks to really bring back your business. And that's why you have the maximum tolerable downtime. You figure out what part of your business needs the expensive option, what part of your business can get by with the cheaper option. And that's how you make a reasonable cost-effective plan. You can have a reciprocal agreement where you make a deal with some business partner to use their data center for a while. That might be an option. You might have a mobile site like AT&T where you've got it in a truck and you can drive it around and that might be a solution. <coughs> you might outsource things temporarily so you don't have to deal with it. You can outsource the business continuity plan and the DR planning itself. Like a lot of people outsource backups, you can even outsource this planning if you want especially if you're putting everything in the cloud. I'm amazed when Amazon went down like four years ago, 7% of the web vanished and they interviewed people. I said, you don't have any backups. They say, hell no. I just put it on Amazon. They say, are you going to, after this, are you going to make backups? They say, no, I'm just going to put it back on Amazon because it's a waste of my time to back up all that junk. I just going to trust Amazon and I accept this amount of downtime. It is a, a appropriate. And I thought that was terrible. I sort of got used to it. Yeah. Yeah, Google does that too. A lot of the data centers are just containers with the fiber optic coming in. <coughs> yep. And uh, they said these guys are backed up inside Amazon at a different Amazon location. So when Amazon went down, it was all down, but they accept all of it because uh, they're willing to accept that downtime for the convenience and all the cost they're saving by not having to have some other system. So here's a bunch of these plans. You have a business continuity plan, a business recovery plan, a continuity operations plan, contingency of continuity support plan, and all this jazz. Many, many, many little plans. And uh, this is basically what was summarized on that big slide with the curvy uh, loop. Uh, just many, many focus, many little plans all going together. The names are all pretty self-descriptive here. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you're like a small restaurant, you obviously can't do all this. And so what you probably would do is just outsource all your IT to somebody else. And um, your only real issue would be uh, to determine if the building burns down or something. I mean, the, you could do it in your own small way. That's why, you know, all, this is what the big corporations do all this. Small businesses will have much smaller versions of this. Most small businesses don't have a disaster recovery plan at all. 
They're just hoping not to have a disaster. So, uh, I mean, the question, they probably do have a plan for like if the cook gets sick, but if the building burns down, they're probably going to give up and just buy another building. Um, so, I mean, if you're really just a single location shop, I don't think any of this would apply to you. But the only time it would make sense is if you're getting bigger. But you definitely have to address these issues as you grow and become more important and you want to make contracts with business partners and, and satisfy insurance regulations and meet compliance requirements. You know, that's why it gets more and more burdensome as you get bigger. So if you want to be a small player, you don't have to bother with this. But this will keep you small. This is the penalty you pay to get big and important. You have to actually play in the big leagues. You have to play the big complicated game now. It's like CCDC. And I decided to make a smaller, simpler contest because my, all of my students are not ready for the big complicated stuff. So, but they're not going to win any big prize at my little purple theme game. So there's your continuity of operations is to move your personnel to an opposite, an alternate site. And you have continuity of support for IT and you have an incident response plan we talked about for cyber attacks, um, occupant emergency to protect the people and a crisis management plan to handle the message traffic between people so everybody knows what's going on. And that includes your communication plan and your call trees and so on, uh, just a way to reach all the people in some planned, organized way. And then of course you have succession planning. The military is good at this. They totally know if one guy dies, who's the boss now? And your corporation needs to have the same issue. If one guy is somehow unavailable or because of the disaster or injured or something, who's the boss now and who's going to make decisions and are they really ready to make decisions? And that's, uh, that's another aspect of maturity. I remember the company I worked at, there was a issue of checks that were the wrong amounts. So the boss decided there will never be any checks issued unless this one guy approves it forever. He created a single point of failure and that was his idea of solving the problem. And that seemed to work for that company, but I was sort of disgusted personally from a logical point of view, um, that's the opposite of this. There was no succession plan. All right. But we weren't that big a company, so we were not playing the really big game. All right. Is somebody still coming in? I expected five anyway. You coming? You're not going to do it? Okay. We'll carry on with four. This is how I won the black badge at DEF CON. I found the contest where everybody was giving up. I said, hey, this thing looks winnable. Anyway. All right, so uh, which value measures the maximum time needed to recover systems? <laughs> That's the recovery time objective. The recovery point objective is how much data you get back, how much data you lose. Recovery time objective is how long it takes to perform the recovery. I almost always get everybody with that one. Right, so which recovery option takes an hour to implement? That's the hot side. And the redundant side is the one that's ready right away. All right, which process uses somebody else's data center? Reciprocal agreement, good. Which plan protects human life? That's the occupant emergency plan. All right. PC Jane and Robert are the winners. 
So it's PC, Jane, and Robert. Okay. Well, that's it for chapter uh, seven. We'll begin the last chapter then. We got about half an hour before lunch. And you can't go to lunch early because it won't be there. So there's no alternative to doing more chapters. This means we'll probably be able to start doing some spunk later today. Um, which I think you will enjoy. As long as you understand that it's not part of the CSSP exam. But it is pretty good stuff to know. So software development security, which, by the way, is something I know almost nothing about. So this is pretty much me memorizing terms I barely understand. So real developers out there, please feel free to speak up and help me because this is all me parroting back junk that I barely understand, like most of the managers talking about the IT stuff. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, in programming, you probably, so machine code is the binary language built into the CPU. That's all the computer ever really runs. Assembly language is the slightly human readable version of machine code to turn it into mnemonics like add and move and, and subtract. Um, and source code is the more human readable high level language like C and Java and Visual Basic, which is then compiled to turn it into machine code. So the compilers translate source code in machine code. Interpreters translate the lines one by one to execute it in real time, um, like Python is often running in interpreted form. And bytecode is what Java uses, which is halfway in between. In order to be platform independent, Java is compiled to bytecode, which then runs in a Java virtual machine, so the same software can run in any hardware. And the consequence of that, as I'm very familiar with in Android, is that the bytecode is almost as readable as the original Java. So if you have a Java app, the distributed executable contains the source code for all practical purposes. And developers frequently do not appreciate this, and they imagine that it is as safe as distributing compiled C code. People like Microsoft give you compiled C code, like Microsoft Office, casually, secure in the knowledge that you will not be able to make your own copy of it, because it's very hard to take that C code and turn it back into source code. But that is manifestly not true of Java. Java bytecode is very close to Java source code. You can read it and modify it and reconstruct the Java from it very easily. So you might as well just be open source if you're using Java. And they typically don't understand that. And this is why I mentioned before in my studies, something like half of all the Android apps use private key encryption to protect their secrets. And then they try to hide the key on your phone. And I can read their source code. You can't hide anything from me when I can read your source code. And it's manifestly obvious that the developers do not realize that they're handing out their source code. Yeah. Oh, if they're running an app, it runs on your server. Well, but if it comes down on their machine and runs in the Java virtual machine locally, then you can recover the source code from that. Yeah. And um, I can show you this. Let's, in, the, in the case of, yeah, in the case, this is actually, this is good, clean, fun. Let's look at the case of Android. Um, so I'll leave this. I put all my Android stuff here. So I, I went through the uh, mobile top 10 and I went to the banks, insurance, and stockbrokers. This is where I started. So I might as well start with the Bank of America. That's where I started. So the Bank of America app, you can, if you run the Bank of America app on your Android phone, you can just, every Android app on your phone, the, in, the original file is an APK file. And every app stores a copy of the APK and then it unzips it. APK is just a zip archive containing all the resources to run it. And you can pull it off the phone and you can open it with a tool called APK tool and it will just unpack it. And now you have full thousand folders and you can now, this contains basically the source code. I'll have, here's what it looks like. This is Java bytecode. It's called Smalley code in the Android system. And so it has, this is the original Java line number. And this is what it is, set object, Set this sets a variable named debit. This sets a variable called set account type, set card number. It's a little funny looking, but it's very readable. 
and you can modify it at this level. And so the green stuff shows what I did. I unpacked the Bank of America app and I added malware into it. So this is malware that takes your ATM card number and puts it in the log, and this takes your PIN and puts it in the log, which is the syslog, which is available to everyone. And this is the code that gives me enough local variables to do that. I added those lines, then you can just repack it. And by the way, to find those, all I had to do was grep for card number. And I found readable lines, card number activity, card ATM debit details activity, you know, all these descriptive names are in the bytecode. And if you have a compiled C application, that is not true. And people don't realize this. So you, I was able to make a Trojanized version of the Bank of America app and use it and it works and the passwords go in the log. Credit card number. So, and I sent this to Bank of America and they don't care. They didn't even answer me. And this is true of almost every app. They're all vulnerable. This, this, this vulnerability I'm describing is M10. There are uh, OWASP top 10 is here, and uh, here's the top 10 risks, and this is the most common one of all, lack of binary protections. You're distributing the source code with your app, and you don't know that. And therefore, anybody can make a modified version of the app. If you want a secure app, get the NFL app. The NFL put out an app and it was totally insecure and sent your password in plain text. So some security researcher wrote a blog about it and they were humiliated. So they actually improved their security. So now the NFL app is far more secure than any app from a bank, insurance company, or anybody important. They, you can't, the NFL app checks integrity. When you launch the app, it checks to see if it's been modified. And if it has, it just pops up a box saying, you must update your app before you can connect to our server. That is very easy to do, but the Bank of America just can't be bothered. I shouldn't be allowed to modify code. Android code is signed. But they didn't change? So right they never did anything. In fact, they didn't answer me for about a year. And then when I went to B-Sides in Las Vegas, um, three of these bank security officers came to grab me on the line privately and say, we want you to stop bad mouthing the Bank of America. And I said, oh, you're the security officer. Said, Shh, you can't say I was here. You can't use my name. I'm not allowed to admit that I go to these evil hacker conferences. But but we want you to stop bad mouthing the Bank of America. And I said, well, are you going to fix it? And he said, no. And I said, well, then we got a problem, <laughs> but they don't care. The only thing I found that they're willing to fix is when they break HTTPS, because you can actually get hurt for that. The FTC actually punished two companies for doing that. But um, although it did take, when I, anyway, I had a real adventure notifying these guys about these things. Uh, there is no vulnerability disclosure process to any of these companies at all. If you find a problem, just forget it. There's no way to reach anybody. There is no email, there's nothing. The only thing I was able to do is find the CEO of the company on Twitter. And I discovered this, if you contact the CEO of Bank of America or Schwab on Twitter and say, please follow me for direct message, he will do it. Of course, I hate doing that because anybody can tell what I'm saying. There's only one thing I could possibly have to say to a person like that. <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah. Well, no, I think this is considered industry standard. Right, but it must have come up the chain. I've, they must, they, I've seen people, whoever you contact, it doesn't come up. Because whenever I sent in something, it gets done. I would say yeah. it doesn't well, work then. Well, these are, still, these are still true. I'm still still my homework to hack into the Bank of America. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, iOS compiles to native code, oh, and it's as secure as this. This is a problem with using Java. Which, by the way, landed. Yeah, encrypt the disk. <laughs> if you encrypt the disk, um, I don't think it would do anything at all about this for the same reason it would do no nothing on a server. Because you use when the phone is running, it's decrypting the disk, and I get this from the running phone. Isn't the iOS like you know secure that system because they did uh, here's see in iOS there are several defenses. The first thing is it's really written in C plus plus or fourth or something and really compiled, so the end result is much less readable. In the second place, if I make a modified iOS app, I can't get it onto your phone because you can only put on apps from the official store, and Apple won't let me put it in the store. So there are defenses, primarily administrative defenses, but Android has none of that. Now the only defense it has is I could not call it an update and update the existing app because it has a signature. The signature is self-signed, so I can make a signature just as good, but it won't let you put on an update unless it has the same signature. And I can't reproduce the Bank of America signature because I don't have their private key. So I would have to 
social engineer you into removing the old app and putting on mine. But I, but, or I would have to target people that don't have the old app. And of course, the people most vulnerable to that are the Chinese because they block access to Google, so they cannot get to the real Android Play Store. So they have to load everything from unauthorized third-party Play Stores. So I can just put Poison Apps in Play Store. And since Google doesn't, doesn't uh, control the Play Store with a damn because they don't verify who people are. So the first banking, first bank to put their app in the Play Store, they had a banking app, and then somebody called the bank to complain about it, and they said, we don't have an app. It wasn't from that bank. Some enterprising black hat made a fake bank app. This happened to me after this. I did airlines. I did like the top 10 or 20 airlines and I found the spirit airline apps and it was a piece of crap. It sent your password up in plain text. And I said, Hey man, your, your own website is HTTPS and you still let your app send it up in HTTP. What's wrong with you? So I sent him an email and they said, we don't have an app. And I'm like, well, I got news for you. <laughs> Somebody put up a spirit airline app. And by the way, it's insecure. But they said, we don't care. It's not our app. And I said, well, gee, I, I kind of feel like you should care, but I suppose you've got a point. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. But all you have is a Gmail address. Somebody's you don't even know who's putting anything in the Android Place. Supposedly, still airline customers. I know. I know. This might. Well, that's true. Well. But here's another thing: they can't really do anything about it. They don't have the signature. What they can do is complain to Google or something. But I, then I found um, the, all the top um, universities had the problem. The Air Force Academy, West Point Academy, they were all using apps made by a company called Straxis, and they broke HTTPS in all cases, and they made their own browser that did it. So you, and they had social networking links in there, so I could steal Facebook passwords and Gmail passwords from the app. And I thought, this is really getting kind of thick when Google will put apps in the Play Store that I can use to steal Google passwords. I would think they would care. But yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, there's a reason the Android updates never get there because the, the carrier wants to charge money for features, and the update has new features that you would get for free. So it would cut their, they have a financial reason to block the updates. That's why Google only like a year ago finally announced there's going to be two update channels, a feature channel and a security channel. And it will be okay to let the security updates through because they won't have features. And they have never done that. That's why I say Google is finally beginning to learn of this fantastic idea called Patch Tuesday, which Microsoft did about 10 years ago. Google has to do the same thing and they're only beginning to wake up to that. Have you seen the video of Chinese click phone. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen the ten thousand phones yeah. to do fake reviews on apps. So that's why I don't yeah. believe that any of these apps are doing. Well, that's true. There's certainly oh, that's the same thing to Amazon and everything. Mechanical Turk, you can rent them. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Anyway, so um, that's good stuff. Anyway, so we're there. This is software security. Um, so you got procedural languages where you have subroutines like C and Fortran. You got object-oriented languages like. Uh, Python and Ruby and C++ that let you create these abstract data structures and objects that can have other objects inherit from them. Metasploit is written in Ruby. Metasploit, the common hacking tool, and it's very easy to read. Ruby is quite popular, and now everyone seems to be loving Go. Go is the new hotness. I guess I'll have to learn Go. Um, so the fourth generation programming languages, of course, are ones that automatically generate code with AI. This is coming very fast. So it will, um, there are various programs up here that will try to create code on the fly in various ways. These are not AI yet, but AI is definitely coming. And the original use of AI, they say, will be assistance. Like you used to have Clippy that would help you write a document. You're going to have more and more automated environments that write more and more of the code for you. Um, so case uh, is programs that assist in the creation and maintenance of other um, tools. There's tools that support one task, workbenches, and then environments like Visual Studio that give you everything to help you drag and drop and build code in a friendly environment. I was surprised Microsoft has been trumpeting Windows subsystem for Linux. So you can run a bash command prompt on the command prompt. And I, a guy came and visited a visiting talk at my college that invented a penguin, a Linux version just for that. And he said he's employing four full-time programmers, as the enterprise customers buying it because there apparently is a real market of people 
who want to write Linux software in Visual Studio on Windows because they love Windows and they love that environment and they don't want to use Linux. And to me, this sounds like you're a lunatic if you want to write Linux software, don't you just get a Linux virtual machine? But they really want to live in the Microsoft Windows developer environment and they want to write and debug Linux code on Windows and Microsoft is now supporting this. So the difference between Linux and Windows is blurring and it's going to blur more and more and more as we go forward. Yeah, yeah. It's getting much better than it used to be. And the latest version supposedly can go right to the hardware so you can finally run things like Nmap in it. So uh, apparently the Microsoft used to be very hostile at the Linux and they are really embracing Linux now and getting over it. So you have top-down programming where you start with a high-level description of what you want and then you write the modules. And then you have bottom-up where you start with the detailed routines and then build something out of it. Um, you can have closed source code like Microsoft Office where the code is a industrial secret and they try to protect it. And all you get is the compiled files and they rely on the fact that you cannot easily reverse the compilation to get the source code. And you have open source where you deliberately uh, hand out the source code. And then there are various other alternatives where like freeware or shareware or, or crippleware where you get limited access to the source code or the program without paying. So things can be public and free to use or proprietary and there's an end user license agreement. And I should mention something that uh, I don't know if it's come up in this class, but it's a frequently asked question. All my stuff is free to use. I have a use policy here. So anybody can use my stuff. You can take my slides and my projects and everything. You can print it in a book, put your name on it, sell it and keep the money, any damn thing you want. The only thing you can't do is commit a crime with it and expect me to save you. But all my stuff is, public domain commercial for what it's worth. All right, available for use without restriction. Anyway, um, but it is a good idea to have an official statement like that. Otherwise, people can't use it if they want to use it. And I know several uh, companies for their internal training, they are using my malware analysis stuff. So that's fine. Anyway, so um, uh, all right, there's various different licenses here. The open source people I see always arguing about the GNU public license versus the other public license. And uh, if you really want to use open source software, there are restrictions on what you're allowed to do with it, and they will get all mad and yell at you if you do the wrong thing. Um, so there are development models. This is the original one, the waterfall model, where you just have like an assembly line like you're building a car. So you determine the requirements, hardware and software, then you have analysis and design and coding, testing, operations, and you're done. This, of course, would be nice if life could only be so simple. This fits Microsoft's old business model where they're going to sell you Windows 95 on a floppy in a box like a candy bar, and you give them money, and now we're done. The problem is if you sell you like Windows 7 in a box, then you come back next week and say, hey, I got hacked and I need a driver update and I need a security update and this feature doesn't work. And so suddenly I have to like have to pay a whole team to keep writing patches and repairs and fixes and dealing with problems. And suddenly I'm not getting any money from you and I'm doing all this extra work I didn't get paid for. So Microsoft get more and more frustrated until they're strongly pushing a subscription model like Office 365. It would be a far more accurate reflection of the situation if you just paid me 30 bucks a month to use my stuff because it's like adopting a child. You come back every day needy, hungry for more, and it, therefore you ought to be paying me a continuous stream of money to service you. That would be a far more accurate representation of the situation. And that's the same thing here. This is not the way it really is in the modern world. You begin it, you finish, you're done, bam, that's over. Now we don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> so you have the modified waterfall where there is a situation where something fails here and you send it back. This means you have a lot of wasted time and a lot of, now you're uncertain how long it's going to take and you don't really know how far you are. Then you got the Sashimi model where it's, the systems overlap and you got the, um, something frozen up on me here. All right. Then there's Agile, where it was Scrum and Extreme Programming, where you try to form teams. The Scrum team tries to have one team do all the stages because the fundamental problem is it's, it's certainly totally what happens at my college, and it happens at almost every company. The easiest way to solve my problem is by just creating a big work problem for someone else. And by the way, I should mention, this is DevOps, and if you 
haven't read the, how many people read the Phoenix Project? That is the wrong answer. That's like Twitter. You should all read the Phoenix Project. This is it. Okay. Um, let's go to Amazon. I'm going to go to Experience Phoenix Project. I spelled it too badly. There we are, Phoenix Project. There. Uh, come on, stop messing with me. There we are, the Phoenix Project. Okay. But this this is written by famous software developers like G, like George Spafford. And what it is, this is a fiction novel. You can read it like a science fiction story, but it is explaining a scientific concept. And the, this is modeled after a book my father gave me called Flatland. Flatland explained what two dimensions was and what three dimensions was for geometry in the form of like a science fiction story. This explains what DevOps is. I never understood DevOps until I read this book and it made it so wonderful and clear and it's so fun to read and easy. Every student should read this and every teacher should read this. This is fantastic. What this book is, is a fictionalized account of a company that needed to switch from old, the old software models to DevOps and how they did it. And it is the thing that is scary is when I read this, it's exactly what happened at my college and all the businesses. Everybody thinks, you know, they talk about people that do something like uh, survive rape or something. They all feel miserable. They feel like they're the only one. They don't know that everybody else is suffering just the same. Every company has the same problems and nobody knows this. So in this book, this guy is an auto plant company. So they the hire a new, develop, a new top level executive to clean up this place that's not working very well. The current situation, we have a software product that goes to hardware stores where they sell our parts. And the software product is like a year out of date. We have new products and new design features, but we can't get them through the process. People, the developers have an idea. The sales team asks for new features. The developers try to write the new idea. They write it, but then it goes to the quality control team. They don't have exactly the same version of all the libraries, so they bounce it back, and it doesn't work. And by the time they... It takes them months to resolve this, and by the time they're done, what they actually push out no longer meets the requirements of the sales team, and it never makes it to the end users anyway because their system's really not the same, and it doesn't work very well, and the library dependencies aren't right, and so they're constantly having trouble tickets and repair processes, and everybody is going nuts, and nothing is getting done, and we're like a year behind, and all the employees are losing morale, and they're all disgusted, and everybody's blaming everybody else, and nothing is getting done, so please clean up this horrible mess. And he tries to clean up this mess with the usual techniques of making people review work and work harder and stuff, and it doesn't get anywhere. And this sort of hippie guy wanders in and says, oh, you're going about everything wrong, and Mike, you got to do it another way. And the way to do it is you have to reorganize the whole system so that, he said, you have to make the flow chart and determine how work passes from one step to another, and then you have to make it so that everybody understands if I am the developer, then my customer is the quality control team. And they have to be happy with what I produce. Whoever is the next step in line is your customer. And you have to have the most important feedback. He said, it turns out the most wasteful thing is when things go back a step. That ruins everything. So make it so the most important feedback for every team comes from the next people that touch it. And if anything about it is bad, that is the top priority item. If they're complaining, fix that right away before you do anything else. Fix whatever stops it from moving forward. And you develop this so every team understands this. And now nobody can save time by screwing somebody else. They will quickly find out that it's not acceptable to make your job easier by making someone else's job harder. And they're all finally going in the same direction. And the company that started all this was Amazon. And this, the original plan was, we went to the company, this fictional company, he said, we have planned for a 90-day rollout of new versions. We're supposed to have four new versions a year, and right now we're a whole year behind. But we're hoping you can get us up to a 90-day update cycle. And the hippie that wanders in said, forget that. You should plan on 1,000 updates per day. Amazon does 144,000 rollouts of new code per day. And the way that, so here's the rules. You have to throw away everything you think you know. There is no IT department. The part that really got me was the description of the IT department at the old company. It said the IT department is 
a team, but there's only one guy that knows anything called Bob, and nothing ever gets done right unless you get to Bob, and Bob is always so overworked that he's crazy, and so you can't even talk to Bob. There's these people you have to talk to before you get to Bob, and every time you talk to them, if you somehow get past them, the CEO wanders in with his laptop and needs a virus cleaned off, and he makes Bob do that, because Bob is the only guy that knows what's going on around here, and that's exactly the way it was at my company, every company I've ever worked, because everything's so disorganized, that even though the lower level staff knows how to do things, there's always something Bob forgot to tell them that they need to know. And Bob is so overworked, he never has time to write it down or teach anybody anything. I remember when we ran out of time and we didn't have enough time to interview candidates or train them so we couldn't get any new staff. This is very common. And so he said, you have to, the first rule, no IT department. Everybody is responsible for IT. Everyone in the whole company has to understand IT and they have to be a programmer. Every single one of them has to understand how to automate their job. So whatever it is you do, it's like quality control. Code comes and you test it and decide if it goes back. Write a flow chart. I do these 10 tests, put them in order, write a code. You have to make it so your job is automated for 90% of the situations and only the exceptions come to you. And every person has to learn to do that. And everybody has to do that. And then you have these strong feedback loops where every single thing that happens to you that is caused by the step before you in the line goes right back to them and they instantly find out and they have to fix it. And now what happens is it might take you about half a year to get there, but when you get there, a normal update, somebody requests an update like the sales team, the developer would write it, it hits the automated quality control process, which it passes most of the time, and that doesn't take any time, then it passes the deployment package and everything, and also you have to have strict version control like GitHub, everybody has to use it. So everybody always has exactly the same version of everything everywhere, all the way to the end user. You're totally wasting your time until you have that. And once you have it, it's now a smooth running machine. And this is why Amazon can have 144,000 rollouts of new code per day, because you want a feature, you write a feature, it goes right out. Because unless it fails a test, everything is automated. And so now you can, your company has moved from living on a static product until it's time for the next big leap to the next static product to a living organism where your company is constantly changing to meet demands. So Amazon can do A-B testing in real time. They can say, should we put these two products on the homepage or those two products on the homepage? Well, we'll put these two on 10,000 homepages for half an hour and these two on 10,000 homepages for half an hour and record how many sales we have and within, at the end of that hour, we will know which of them sold more and we'll switch to that. And they can really do that. And their sales and marketing team are doing that. And this is why there's even a whole science of hacking Amazon. You can get apps that will tell you how to get things cheaper at Amazon because Amazon displays a different price to every viewer. They record your history and your location and they decide how much they think they can get out of you and they change the price. And everything about it is dynamic. There's not a static web page which will be updated in 30 days. There's a living thing calculating what to show everybody. And it's a whole living organism constantly changing behind that. And that is DevOps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And people in location, but that's what you should do, right? Yeah. That's, that's business. business. Yep. And, and there's an app you can put in your browser that will tell you when a book falls to the price you want to pay and look for bargains. And, you know, it's, it's not at all like there's a page on a server that is the Amazon page and it won't update till tomorrow. Not in the slightest. Every single bit of that is dynamic and all this data goes into that. And that is the right way to do it. And so, I mean, that's, that, this is awesome. You should all read this book and make your students read it. It's, and it's fun to read. It's a fiction book. And, and it, no, no, it's not that long. I found it very, no. And, and these are real computer scientists that collaborated to write it. And the thing is, oh, I don't know. I give them extra credit. You'll do anything for extra credit. <laughs> my dad gave me the one, this, <clears throat> no, my dad gave me the previous generation. This was done in the 50s. This all came from a book in the 50s called Flatland. This is a form of science education where you write a science fiction story to explain a technical concept. This is really what most science fiction is, but most of it focuses on the fiction. There are, occasionally there are scientists and mathematicians that deliberately write fiction just as a form of teaching, and that's what this is. And I think it should happen more often because these are real computer scientists. And so you won't find much character development or anything. 
but it's about it's about as good a story as most science fiction. But the real lesson is the technical side. And I'll say it helps me because I heard about DevOps for years and I could not understand even what it was. That's true, but, but I couldn't even understand what it is or why I should care. And this made me understand both of those very well. Now I understand how this is enormously important. This will totally change your company and make it a more pleasant place to work and a more profitable place to work. Now all the people are not frustrated. They're happy to have this exciting company where good things are happening and they're succeeding. You know, I remember there's another thing I learned when I was working at the escrow agency, the manager, or my manager is kind of hostile and abusive. And they interviewed managers, like 80% of managers said, our employees are lazy, they won't do anything unless we kick them. But when they interviewed employees, 80% of them said, the best day is when I show up at work, I know what I'm doing, I have what I need, and I'm productive. That's when I'm happy. I really like to do my job. What makes me crazy is when I show up and I don't have the instructions I need, I don't have the supplies I need, I can't get anything done, people are yelling at me and I don't know what to do. That's what makes me miserable. It's not like I want to sit there doing nothing. I'd rather do my job. That would be great. And the managers should not see themselves as like slave masters whipping you to make you move. They should see themselves as someone getting the obstacles out of your way so you can do what you're good at. That would be a far more productive reflection of the real situation. Anyway, I guess it's about time to break for lunch, which makes sense. <clears throat> and uh, I'm glad I got to tell you that. I forgot that not everybody knows this. This will be worth more than the whole class if you read that book, probably. Because we've all got to go to DevOps. And this will explain it better than anything. Anyway, let's get out of here and go to lunch. <laughs>